So my starting point is gender-based violence, sexual violence when it comes to conflicts and to universal jurisdiction. I think it's been, it's been made clear uh, so far from all the speakers that have talked here that universal jurisdiction it is an essential tool and instrument to combat severe international crimes that affect us all. So in that sense, it is also a key tool to fight against impunity from uh, of uh, sexual and gender-based crimes. So I believe that the presence of universal jurisdiction must have and actually has a gender perspective to it. Why should it have that gender perspective? Well, because we all know that when it comes to conflicts or situations of conflicts, I'm not only talking about armed conflicts, but uh, conflicting situations that could lead to the commission of crimes, both uh, men and women and children suffer are sufferers of different forms of violence. Well, but in that cases, uh, those crimes of violence are only suffered by women. For instance, I don't know, vile rape or forced abortion or castration for men. So that gender perspective allows us to notice those forms of violence, and it also allows us to help us uh, understand the impact of them all, because it gives us the context, tells us about the meaning that men and women have within that context, the role that each of them play within that society or that community, and what is the meaning of attacking them in that fashion. And that's why sexual violence is widely used, because of the great impact that has, or specific impact it has in some communities. Well, there are uh, antecedents or precedents in terms of universal jurisdiction. And here I'd like to refer to the Guatemalan case. So we will continue to prosecute it. And in that case, it was just an option, or rather an opportunity, to make progress in terms of introducing the gender perspective. Women's link appeared or was part of the case in the year 2009. Well, the case had been prosecuted for some years now. They had like 40 pundits and witnesses. Lots of visual evidence had been provided. However, we were facing a challenge, the challenge. We didn't really want the victims or the survivors to appear again in court. We didn't want to bring them back. And then we managed not to do so as we and we decided to use this uh, expertise and these pundits that were specialized in gender based issues well these we had cases of women who had suffered multiple raping not only because they had been well they had been raped by several military people daughters or, or, or children or little girls that have been victims of sexual violence that was out there we, we also had forensic reports where we could see that the women were naked from waist down so there were lots and lots of clues and signs that told us that they have been victims of uh, sexual violence so we wanted to make it violence we wanted to evidence to surface all that and then to bring charges against the perpetrators and then we did um, we worked with experts and then well, because there was an obligation, there was an obligation to investigate and to prosecute these crimes. And also because, well, the sexual violence that had taken place under the armed conflicts was also recovered or covered in this, um, in this declaration. We were really successful and the judge that uh, took care of this cause 
issued a ruling saying that whenever there is an investigation in this type of situations or investigation of any crime against humanity, that investigation should include the gender-based perspective. And what has been the impact of all that? Well, from that strategy, from that strategy, in Guatemala, sexual, gender, sexual and gender-based crimes were included or uh, put at the same level that genocide. Well, we've been trying to make these cases visible. However, there had not been any legal platform for those cases to be fully recognized. This strategy has a significant impact, and therefore, in Guatemala, they contacted us. They asked us to issue an expert opinion within that framework, and then we just issued, I issued the, my expert opinion in the case of Rios Mont. That actually allowed to support the testimony of 10 brave women who gave testimony at the trial and together with the expert opinion, setting out all the legal keys and um, stating the need to investigate and prosecute these crimes and also offering some uh, case law examples, we manage we manage to have sexual and gender-based crimes included as lesion of genocide, also constituting genocide as well as war crimes. And actually, I'd like to play a video because I wanted to present or to introduce you, well, to illustrate my points. Throughout history, sexual violence has been used as an instrument of war during armed conflicts. However, these crimes against women, more often than not, are not prosecuted, therefore leading to generalized impunity. Unless we make them visible, impunity will continue to be there. In Guatemala, women and children were victims of sexual crime as part of genocide. In the first case, the first case where a national court tried and a former head of a state due to genocide and war crimes, sexual and gender-based crimes were included within the process and in the conviction. Truth and justice for women and girls in Guatemala. In societies such as Guatemala, women suffer uh, sufferers of violence just for the sake of being women. So whenever, primarily or especially whenever we exercise our rights, we are victims of uh, this violence. That's why we have international conventions that m oblige states to adopt legislation and also well to ensure that women have a life free of violence during the internal armed conflict in Guatemala, same as in most cases, the forms of violence that are implemented or carried out to women and to men are different. So therefore, that's why we need a gender perspective where we really want to analyze the different forms of violence uh, according to the gender of the victim. It is very important to make it visible, to prosecute and to sanction all these facts because they should never be repeated. The survivors, survivors of these types of crimes, that's what they demand, that's what they expect from us. They don't want that to happen again. They don't want that to happen to the future generations. They don't want any woman anywhere in the world to be victims of these crimes. Actually, these crimes are just committed to them for the sake of being women. What is your full name? Paloma Soria Montañez, I am a lawyer expert in gender-based crimes. Then we have the mutilation or the bodies that were hanging from the trees with objects inserted in the vaginas or raped many indigenous women 
were pregnant not only from the rapist, from the multiple rapists, but some of them were passed on sexually transmitted diseases, and therefore the reproduction capacity capacity was limited or diminished. This was part of the strategy conceived by the army to exterminate this eth this um, ethnic group. So they are throwing away. Well, actually, we are the collateral victims of conflict and sexual violence against women. They said that it was an effect of the war and something that could not be controlled and that happened at that time. I disagree with that. It was part of the strategy of genocide. They wanted to eradicate these peoples. Expert opinion as a tool for development. We were facing the challenge that we didn't want to bring back the victims. We wanted to avoid victimization. We didn't want to find new victims either. So we designed a strategy consisting in enlarging the case. And then where we could take a look at all the evidences, find for signs of uh, gender-based crimes, and to present them to the judge, and then to see whether they constituted torture or genocide. And then for the first time in these cases of universal justice, we introduced two expert opinion, gender-based expert opinion. Victory for women, victory for justice. Well, at the trial in Guatemala, we had, well, this has been a significant experience for Guatemala, for our region. So 10 women there to break the silence, they came to the city, they faced the perpetrators, they said, this is what happened to me and I don't want any other woman to suffer this again. Some of them mentioned that they were not only raped by one soldier, but, but several of them. So it was a highly impactful moment when they were narrating these facts again. So the women are no longer given the possibility to tell the truth. So any type of violation to human rights that does not have a does not have a gender perspective. And if this is this, the gender perspective, you know, there's significant submission is in place, breaking the silence. There's silence in a country such as ours with such a great stigma, uh, with a great stigma that women have. So it is a sign of courage, a sign of uh, braveness and uh, commitment, commitment to bring change through justice. Well, it seems that it is not possible to build a future if you don't know what happened in the past. So that this does not happen again in Guatemala. We really need to know what happened in the past. I think this is extremely important to build democracy, a state of law. If women against women are made silent, it means that democracy works for all, but for some, but not for all. This is a historical process that proves that gender-based crimes have to be prosecuted in the trials. Um, against human rights. The voice of women must be heard. Gender-based crimes must be prosecuted.
We cannot accept impunity. Well, little else to add. I think, well, the video is explanatory. Universal justice, we all agree that it has promoted and encouraged many national courts to prosecute their own perpetrators. We are at a time where impunity prevails, so we cannot really afford to lose the tools that help us fight against that impunity. So we really want to have gender perspective in the future, presence everywhere, should also be translated into the processes of transnational transitional justice. And as Claudia Pazampas, the prosecutor, mentioned before, if there is no justice for all, that justice is discriminatory. It has been proven that sexual and gender-based crimes are present in every single uh, uh, conflicts, and if there is impunity, the message that is launched is a uh, message of tolerance. And Guatemala case is an example. In Guatemala, there is a high rate of killings of women, even higher than those of uh, in, in Mexico, feminicide. So visibilizing these crimes was putting a stigma on these women. These women were excluded from their community, but it has also allowed and tolerated the violence, the current violence, to take place. Therefore, it is very important to what happens with mechanisms such as universal jurisdiction. They allow us to say stigma should not be on women. What happened to women was not purely collateral damage. There were international crimes that must be prosecuted and then a dialogue is open to reconsider these options and then, well, to reinstate those women in that community and to treat them, to give them treat them as survivors of uh, crimes. So I'd like to reiterate the importance that no matter in what phase of the proceedings, proceedings you, are, you are in, we, we arrived in Guatemala a few years later, but in any case, there are always methodologies out there that allow us to investigate those crimes. The great challenge is that those methodologies do not re victimize the victims, but rather they help accompany the victims. This is one of the main challenges that we face. Thank you so much. What is your opinion about the elimination of the most basic rights of women in places with Islamic authoritarian regimes, or even in other countries with more moderate political systems but with a strong presence of masculine religion? What could the international community do in that regard? Well, I'd like to share with you a personal experience. When I was at the court, uh, I visited Misrata. It was a city that was surrounded by the Gaddafi's tank. When I arrived in Gaddafi, I could see five kilometers of tanks that had been destroyed. And I said, well, how could these people resist it, the attack of the tanks? The people are from Mirata took me to a museum, a museum where I could see photographs of their martyrs. And I said, well, this is highly impressive. I knew the episode, but I, I, I've never seen these people's faces. However, I have missing photographs of the raped young girls. And I said, well, if you are marginalizing them now, that is a double problem, that is a double trouble. What are you doing with these uh, victims? So one of them was the director of a program of human rights in Misrata. I said, well, we have a specific uh, program for them. And I said, well, and what about the program? Tell me about it. And he said, well, the problem with these raped women is, or little girls is that they, have, they are no longer virgins, so they cannot get married, and they will be marginalized in Libya for life. To face that problem, we have promoted the idea of having someone get marrying them. And in order to show my leadership, so if I have two women, I will marry 
two of them. So a 15-year-old who has been raped, the only way out, the best offer was to be the third or the fourth uh, wife of this man who had good intentions and wanted to help them out. So me as a prosecutor had nothing to say, and I was like, mm, I couldn't say anything else. What is your opinion? I think that the reasoning here is not that much or about specific uh, religions. We, uh, women are discriminated against just for the sake of being women. Also, well, in countries where there are different, uh, different religions. So in Spain, there is uh, a threat to amend a law that would also diminish or reduce uh, uh, rights, uh, uh, rights that women enjoy nowadays. So we have to be aware that discrimination is uh, still there nowadays, that discrimination generates violence, and therefore has to be faced from the bottom, from the bottom line. It is not a question about religion only. So we have to change all the prejudices, all the stereotypes that exist in society that more often than not are the triggers and the causes of the discrimination that women suffer. Well, the stigma of these little girls that have been raped, that the only alternative that they have is to marry the rapist. No, 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 not the rapist, but uh, marry other m men. Oh, I thought were the rapist. No, 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 just the other way around, OK? This man, well, perhaps I went too fast. No, 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 he was a defender of human rights, or promoting human rights. And then, well, the idea were wanted to offer them the possibility to become their third wife. But, well, in his tradition, sounded like a normal solution. So and I said, well, this is a culture. Well, we don't have any right to interfere with that. So that is to say the idea of universal community requires us to be highly respectful of ideas that we fully disagree with. Well, yes, but the stigma that these little girls suffer is the stigma suffered by other women in the world. We are not talking about a specific religions. A stigma of raped women appears everywhere. So we have some awards for, for gender and justice. We do monitoring of favorable and unfavorable uh, sentences or rulings uh, for in this type of cases. So we are seeing cases where raped women as an alternative that is offered to them is to marry the person who has raped them. So in this case, the role of judges is so remarkable, so relevant, because they are in a position to eliminate that stigma. Why the women who are victims of sexual crimes are the ones that are discriminated against instead of the rapists? These are the barriers that we have to bring down, despite the type of culture, this type, the type of religion that we are discussing. The reality is that women and, and girls are discriminated despite the country we are talking about. Thank you so much. All right. So we close with you two. And the question is as follows. What are the groups that you work with to make these gender-based crimes visible? And what would you suggest for judges to protect these uh, facts? Well, one of the things that we often see when it comes to working with gender-based issues is that sometimes we have women's organizations doing lots of lobbying and pressure, and they do a wonderful job in terms of making that visible. But sometimes they don't see courts as the place to take their claims. On the other hand, we have many human rights organizations that understand that courts are one of the main actors that will help them move forward their claims, however, that they do not include uh, any gender-based perspective. Then, in first of all, I fully agree with Carlos. They are victims survival. Uh, uh, 
where survivors and victims are key players, but also the role and the work uh, made by women's association and human rights association, the joint work that they carry out. That is what actually enables that gender-based crimes uh, becomes visible. I gave the example of Guatemala, but it could also be the case in Colombia. In Colombia, there are many women's associations that are documenting all the evidence about these conflicts. They are raising their voice. They are asking for a recognition and visibility. So it is very important that these organizations carry out, carry out this joint work and, of course, to, well, to fight against impunity for these gender-based crimes and also the role played by judges. Well, we are all clear on that. We in the Spanish state, we've been lucky, uh, lucky to have uh, highly committed uh, judges and prosecutors to fight against impunity. It is also very important that they are there and that they also have that gender-based uh, perspective because well, we know that all the crimes are equally severe. So it is important that no